having a government monopoly on currency is monetary communism. Nobody calls it this, but it fits the definition perfectly. Hello, and welcome back to the Coin Stories podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brunel, and we are talking to some of the leading voices in Bitcoin, their backstories, how they were first introduced to Bitcoin, and their take on what the cryptocurrency offers. I'm so excited to share my guest for this episode is Bitcoin maximalist Pierre Richard. Pierre co-founded the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute and has been a researcher, investor, and software developer in the Bitcoin space since early 2013. Pierre is also the strategist for the crypto exchange Kraken, putting him at the forefront of exploring Bitcoin's potential as a monetary system. Here's Pierre. Okay, so I want to start at the very beginning. You're from Paris. Yes, I am. Tell me a little bit about what growing up there was like. Um, yeah, so I was born there. Um, my uh, parents uh, were from Brittany, which is a coastal Atlantic part of the country. Um, but they, they were in Paris uh, when they had me and my, my brothers as well. Um, and it, it was, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I was only there until I was four years old. So I don't have a huge number of memories, uh, but they were good memories, I guess. Uh, and then we moved to Scotland uh, due to my dad's job in semiconductors. And they moved him around quite a bit. And then we ended up in Phoenix, Arizona and Austin, Texas, uh, which is currently where I live in. Wait, um, so what did yeah. your parents do? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Like, what was your childhood like in terms of were you... I'm from Europe, too, so I kind of feel like a lot of people had a very similar lifestyle where maybe equate it to a middle class in America where you had all your needs met, you had, you know, opportunities to go outside and play with your friends, and you didn't have too many cares in the world. Indeed, yeah. It was a pretty, um, you know, life of first world problems, I guess, is the uh, the way to put it. Um, and yeah, the, you know, I think that the key part of where this intersected with, you know, my current interest in Bitcoin is that, uh, I moved back to France when I was in high school and being able to see, um, how French school was different than American school and even, uh, the different cultures and the different politics of them, uh, it quickly became apparent to me that, um, you know, free markets are the way to go. And that uh, government control of things uh, is does not have great results, because I kind of saw this comparative analysis between what's going on in France and what's going on in the US. I was like, the, the root problem every time is whatever intervention the government's making in the economy. Um, and so that that drove me towards um, well, first of all, it drove drove me towards using Wikipedia as an information source because um, the if you read a French history textbook about World War II. You're, you're getting a completely different story than if you read one about World War II from the U.S. perspective or the Russian perspective. Like yeah. every government is going to spin their history, right. you know, exactly how they want it to sound for the people. Um, and it's always, you know, coincidentally, it's always very glowing for your side and, uh, you know, naysaying everyone else. So um, I, that's, I started using Wikipedia to kind of try to triangulate the truth um because uh it's never you know one way or the other and in any case one day i had an article about anarcho-capitalism that i ran into and it was a featured article on the front page of wikipedia this was like my junior year of high school wow. and um that when i read that article that was basically outlining you know the most extreme form of libertarianism possible uh it immediately resonated with me as like okay this is actually um the the only plausible political ideology I've come across so far because I studied like conservatism and liberalism and Marxism uh, and uh, when, the deeper I got into libertarianism the more sense it made to me and the less sense the others made um, but also with my own life experiences and you know paying some attention to the news in any case part of libertarianism is this uh, this economic school of thought called Austrian economics. Mm -hmm. Um, and so f f from the po politics, I got into the economics and there too, I actually started learning about the other schools of thought in economics and like, uh, so obviously, uh, in the U S we kind of have a mixed economy, right. Uh, and then, uh, the, the, the ideology behind it is Keynesianism yep. is the government has to stimulate the economy when things are going bad. And then when things are going good, 
for some reason they're still stimulating the economy or they're taxing it. Uh, yeah. And so that's kind of the, uh, the, the two policy proposals. Um, and then in, in France, they would also actually teach about communism. Uh, here in the US, they, if, if communism is taught, it's that it's bad, right? Uh, in France, they actually spun communism pretty positively because the French public education system is riddled with actual communists, with you know, card-carrying uh, you know, red Marxist ideologists. Uh, which is relatively rare in the US. Uh, so it's actually, it's funny, there's like objective polling data has shown that a larger percentage of the French population is communist than China. Wow. Uh, the, in China, they're actually more to the right than, than France is. Uh, wow. But um, of course, uh, there's, there's deeper political divisions in France uh, that, that, you know, you have an extreme right, which doesn't really exist in the US. There isn't uh, an extreme right like you have in France that's uh, anti-immigrant and always saying politically incorrect things, although some would argue Donald Trump might have gotten close to that. Um, yeah, there's a lot. I feel like a lot of people yeah. think there's an extreme right right here right now. Yeah, absolutely. So as a libertarian, I'm like, yeah, sure. All of you are status. I mean, all of you are promoting policies that violate human freedom in order to advance your political ideology whether it's banning marijuana dispensaries or banning uh, gun shops. Um, and so in any case, the, the Austrian School of Economics is very much in the free market camp of don't intervene in the economy and magically the economy will grow because everyone's trying to improve their lot in life. Uh, there, there's not really any exceptions to that. Um, and from their perspective, what makes for a good money is a money that the government can't just print because money printing is intervening in the market economy. Um, and so having a government monopoly on currency is monetary communism. Uh, and nobody calls it this, but it fits the definition perfectly, which is that you have the government have an exclusive license over uh, the, this industry of creating money. And um, this monopoly has gone unchallenged until finally we had the emergence of Bitcoin. Um, when I was learning about the Austrian School of Economics, this was before Bitcoin existed, and their solution was always like, well, we need to go back to gold. And the problem is that uh, gold failed for a reason. It's expensive to verify and it's expensive to transport. And so it has these really negative attributes that um, really have to be overcome by a new technology and no amount of political activism on the behalf of libertarians would ever get anyone back onto gold. Um, instead, what's happened is that when uh, fiat currencies hyperinflate, they just get replaced by some other fiat currency that is not hyperinflating. Um, there's not really a return to gold at any point. Right. In any case, uh, that's when I heard about Bitcoin. So, you know, I kind of lost hope on the monetary economic side. I was like, all right, well, we're going to be stuck with fiat for quite a while here. And then um, Bitcoin came along uh, and in 2000, at the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, I went down the rabbit hole um, because I was part of an Austrian economics reading group. Oh, at, really? In Austin. Okay, wait, wait. Before before we get to the rabbit hole, I want to hear a little bit more about your your life experience because um, you have, you moved from France to Scotland and then all the way to the U.S. and then back to France. Can you talk to me a little bit about you know what those moves were like? You said your your dad worked in semiconductors. Uh, yeah. So um, he's uh, a, an engineer um, and. Uh, he actually, you know, he, he's worked both with, with processors, but also as a software developer. Um, and, uh, yeah, those, those moves were, you know, what we would call expatriates, uh, yeah. and, and, um, were really, you know, as a part of this global emergence of semiconductors, um, you know, with, with the computer revolution. Um, and I, I think that that also did influence my views on technology, mm -hmm. um, I've never really been afraid of technology because it's always been around me. You know, my parents got a computer very early and um, my mom herself, she was a software developer. Uh, oh, wow. and so, um, it, it was always a thing when really, you know, they were fairly expensive machines back then. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they, they made that investment and helped teach us about computers. So I think that definitely influenced um, 
Like, I think that, you know, I, I stood a better chance of getting interested in Bitcoin than someone raised by uh, Peter Schiff, you know, his only interest. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh my God, I love that his son is all into Bitcoin now. Um, well, okay, so when, because most people, I mean, even in high school, when you were moving back, it's just, I think it's interesting that you were noting these differences between the education system in the U.S. and what you were being taught there versus in France. Um, did you end up moving back to the U.S. to go to school in Texas, to the university, I mean? Uh, no, that was my senior year of high school. And um, it was that when we went back to France, it was a three-year contract or something like that. And so uh, the contract had... had um, uh, ended and we did have a choice to make. Actually, we could have stayed in France a little bit longer, um, I, I think. But uh, you know, we, we ultimately decided to come back. Um, and it's it's a really nice life in the U.S. Uh, so, arguably, you know, more freedom than in France. Although I'm I'm biased. Less taxes, uh, kind of maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, in any case, um, when when we moved back, I was a senior in high school, and that's when I. I was like, okay, well, college wise, it would be really easy to get into UT Austin because they have this top 10% rule of if you graduate in the top 10% of your high school, you're auto admitted. And it was very close by because I was already in Austin. So, um, but uh, I didn't really think about it too much. But uh, later on, I discovered that they also have a top accounting program. And when I was reading about Austrian economics, I, I did find it fascinating when they highlighted that really it's the financial accounting part that means that you're either building wealth or you're destroying capital. Mm -hmm. And that's what entrepreneurs have to rely on. And uh, that got me really interested in, in accounting. And so I majored in accounting, uh, got my bachelor and master um, and started my career in auditing at Deloitte. What was your dream job at that point? Because Bitcoin didn't, you know, didn't exist at the yeah. time, right? Yeah, I I definitely had it in mind that I would go work in finance in some way. Um, and which part of finance, I was kind of uh, indifferent. I just found the subject matter interesting. And uh, at, at one point, I did think about uh, going into software development. And then I read this Wired article that said that all of these software jobs were getting offshore to India. And I thought to myself, well, that's not a promising career. Why would... Yeah. And yeah. that... That was probably uh, not a great prediction of what was going to happen because totally. uh, obviously software development in the U.S. is alive and thriving at this point. Why do you think there's such a negative view of capitalism in our country now? Uh, yeah, so there's a whole book called The Anti-Capitalist Mentality that uh, uh, catalogs all of the different causes of anti-capitalism in people. Um, it's really it's it's basically it's a mental disorder. I mean, it, it is a phobia that people have. Uh, it's it's not like there's a, a rational basis for it. Um, and so people have a variety of different cognitive biases that that lead them to conclude that, um, you know, other people making more money than them is a problem uh, or that um, they kind of have like a, a, a codependent uh, type of personality where uh, they want the government to take care of them. And then government people want to take care of others. And uh, there's, uh, yeah. So, I mean, that part, though, I always found that, you know, expecting politics to change by persuading people is entirely, you know, a waste of time. Because ultimately, these people, you know, part of the socialist experiment was trying to reprogram people. And uh, it turns out you can't do that. People are the way they are. And so you kind of have to uh, come to them and meet them where they're at. And so the idea of libertarian activism to make political change was uh, always a little bunk to me. But the economic angle of it, of build economic incentives that attract people, well, people are always happy to make more money. Uh, and so um, that's really what I find uh, interesting with Bitcoin is the intersection between this ideology that, that I had uh, and this uh, economic school of thought that I'd studied and an actual like product that would grow. Um, and when I discovered it in 2013, it had already grown quite a bit and it was yeah. clear to me that it worked. And my own understanding of economics was that as long as it continues to work, this is going to increase in value.
Yeah. And uh, that that was kind of my moment of like, okay, well, this is definitely, you know, s something that not only do I think is going to help the world tremendously, uh, but it's also like something I find exciting because of the technology. Okay, so take me to that rabbit hole. So you're, you graduate, you're working for Deloitte as an accountant. How, how do you go from there to, you know, diving down this, this Bitcoin path? Yeah, so it actually, it started my last year of grad school. Uh, I was part of um, a Mises, okay, an Austrian economics reading circle. Uh, and we were just debating various issues within Austrian economics. Uh, there's a lot of uh, debates, for example, between a school of thought that thinks that fractional reserve banking, so uh, banks having demand deposits that you know are instantly uh, withdrawable while investing in 30-year mortgages, uh, might be a problem uh, and cause bank runs. Uh, well, you know, there's a school of thought that thinks that's okay and it will self-regulate, and then there's another school of thought that's like, okay, well, fractional reserve banking is fraud. And anyone doing it uh, is m deliberately misleading people. Um, in any case, so we were debating this and the topic of Bitcoin came up because here was a monetary system that um, ultimately made it a lot less expensive to be your own bank. Mm -hmm. And so then if we don't have to use banks, well, consumers can just decide how they whether they want to use a bank or not. Like today, everyone, if you want to like lead a normal life, you have to have a bank account. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. World. It would be you, you would be an oddball to just be like, I'm cash only. I don't have a bank account. I earn cash. I pay cash like and yet there is a significant, you know, percentage of the population that, that is in that situation. I don't want to, uh, you know, cast aspersions on them. But in terms of like having a mortgage, like you got to have a bank account. If you want to have investments and make financial investments, you have to have a bank account because you got to wire the money from somewhere. Well, and most Americans live on debt. Yes. Yeah. So they've, they, they are borrowing against uh, all sorts of different assets and uh, unsecured credit as well with credit cards. But in any case, um, with Bitcoin, it's like, okay, you don't have to have any of that. And that means that if you want to opt out of the fractional reserve banking system, you, you actually can. Um, because before I was like, no, you have to live within the system and you have to have your social security number. <laughs> um, so I really liked that. And it made sense to me too, that that would attract adoption, right? That there's people who want to be self-sovereign as they say today, uh, and, uh, kind of that individualistic mindset. And then there's people who just want to get rich who are like, okay, there's only 21 million Bitcoin. Um, if I own some fixed percentage of this, then if there's any growth in the user base, then the value is going to increase. And it's just like basic math, right? Um, and that that has actually grown more quickly, I think, than the self-sovereign uh, like mindset of people who are just trying to find more freedom, which aligns kind of with my analysis of the political situation, which is that People just like want to get ahead in life and improve their lot in life. They don't necessarily want to get into politics. Yeah. Because quite often it's demoralizing and no change ever happens yeah. and both sides are corrupt or whatever. So um, in any case, yeah, I'm rambling. Well, no, so, well, yeah. So you sure so you're in a reading group. So was it someone else that basically mentioned it and you're like, oh, what is that? Oh, yeah, I'm going to start yeah. looking into it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Michael Goldstein is the uh, president of the Nakamoto Institute, and he's the one who, um, you know, started shilling Bitcoin to me. Uh, and then there was How also was others who were like interested in it for other reasons. But um, the he and I uh, definitely align quite a bit on the underlying philosophy of Bitcoin and like where it was going, um, and especially like of seeing the innovation in the monetary asset itself because a lot of other people were already talking about like blockchain not bitcoin you know they were interested in the technology exclusively which is a whole different topic <laughs> how did you learn more about it like did you read the white paper and how much was it at the time um it was like twenty dollars fifteen dollars oh wow this was before the april um um cypress bubble where it went up to like 300 dollars or something 
and then it crashed. Anyway, I could go through the whole price history, but um, yeah, that, at that point, uh, there were a few main sources of information. One was the white paper. Another was the Bitcoin.org website. Another was a uh, Bitcoin wiki. And then there was Bitcoin Reddit. And Bitcoin Reddit was definitely like the focal point in terms of community discussion about Bitcoin, right? Like the, the OGs were in this Bitcoin talk forum. Uh, I was never a part of that. Uh, that was like for people older than myself. So like who were the OGs to you? Oh, um, I mean, Roger Veer, Charlie Schrem, uh, and Eric Voorhees, and okay. uh, yeah, they, they uh, Charlie Lee, um, uh, Greg Maxwell. I mean, quite a few of the uh, Bitcoin developers themselves uh, were around back then. Um, and so uh, th those to me, when I, when I got interested in Bitcoin, I was like, I missed the, the train on this. Like it went from zero dollars to... $30 or whatever. And I was like, wow, I just missed out on making all this free money. That yeah. sucks. Well, a lot of people feel like that now. They're like, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people thought it was game over when it hit a dollar. Yeah. They were like, oh, okay. It went from five cents to a dollar. There's no way it could ever go any higher. You know, uh, there's not enough people to adopt it. Uh, and so that's, it's, it's funny that like all of the arguments for and against Bitcoin have never changed. Mm -hmm. They've always been the same. The first few emails that Satoshi got in response to his white paper post were about Bitcoin not scaling and how environmentally destructive it would be and that it would be too volatile. So immediately out of the gate, before the software was released, when Satoshi just released the white paper, there were objections to it along those lines. Uh, and those have really, th those have been the same arguments all along to 13 years later, people are still making those same arguments. Uh, and yet the the price history speaks for itself and the industry speaks for itself in terms of whether those were actually problems or not. Did you always have maybe a voice in your head at the very beginning that was like, maybe, I mean, maybe this could fail and I shouldn't put it, put it all in and risk too much versus, I mean, obviously now you're a maximalist. So where was that? How did that evolution happen? Oh, uh, well, so I would, I would, draw those as two different questions because the the maximalist thing was right away because I was a I, okay I was a multi coiner with gold and silver because to me you did need a smaller unit you know to because gold is too valuable and so I was a silver bug okay so I was not a maximalist before bitcoin when I discovered bitcoin I thought to myself well there's not really any reason to look at any other money because its properties are already uh, perfect, essentially. Uh, and that uh, there's not really any purpose to finding the silver to Bitcoin's gold, which mm -hmm. is what Litecoin was selling itself as. Yeah. Because when I went to the Litecoin stuff, well, I, I had a Litecoiner arguing with me on Facebook is what was going on. And I was like, all right, What's he talking about? It's got faster confirmations. So I go research. All right, what does that mean? It's got faster confirmations. Well, I find an article saying, yeah, it's got faster confirmations, but for the same amount of transaction finality, you still have to wait the same amount of time. And so you just have to wait for more confirmations to get the same level of security. And I thought to myself, okay, so basically these people are creating different cryptocurrencies just to play with trade-offs, right? Of get more of this and get less of that. Hmm. Not like actually growing the pie or, you know, doing something better. Um, that's kind of when I was like, all right, there's not really because the gold to Bitcoin silver thing or the silver to Bitcoin's gold thing also falls apart on the unit, right? They were like, oh, well, you need smaller units. You can divide one Bitcoin into 100 million Satoshis. Right. So it's like the Francis Coppola argument. Like she's on Twitter saying that and yeah, her name intersects with the famous uh, uh, Hollywood uh, producer, but uh, she's actually she's a columnist and or you know a newspaper uh, opinion writer, a blogger, as someone disparagingly call her, um, and she uh, has written arguments along the lines that Bitcoin is not scarce because you can divide it into a hundred million units, and so uh, <laughs> uh, some people don't really understand like fractions, right. but uh, let's blame that on the public school system. Um, <laughs> in any case. Uh, the so immediately the arguments I was getting for 
having multiple different blockchains and multiple different assets, all of them were coming up intellectually short. And that's what drove me to, first of all, being annoyed with the people repeating these arguments, because uh, knowing that they're false, I was like, why don't you, why doesn't my response to their argument ever persuade them to change their minds? It's because they hold a bunch of that asset. And so I was like, all right, these people are, you know, they're motivated by their bags. They're not really going to be intellectually honest about uh, what's going on with the trade-offs. Yeah, that's true. Wait, so did you, when did you put all of your, I guess, wealth or savings into Bitcoin? Well, so I had negative wealth because I was a college student deeply in student loan debt. Okay. Um, and that is part of, you know, the millennial uh, life experience. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I wish that I was Michael Saylor at the time with like a <laughs> billion dollars to go out and spend on Bitcoin and Don't just buy all? Bitcoin. Uh, but no, uh, I was I was born at a different time. Uh, and, you know, that's so that that is what it is. Um, now, I've been accumulating since, um, but I you know, one of the first questions that a lot of people have of anyone involved in Bitcoin is like, how many Bitcoin do you own? And it's like uh, a very, to, to me, bizarre question, um, because first of all, part of Bitcoin's ethos is that there you should have financial privacy. Mm -hmm. And one of the counter arguments against Bitcoin that you'll hear from proponents of Monero and Zcash is that Bitcoin has bad privacy. And, and so... I find it amusing that uh, the, the Monero and Zcash shills, uh, they can't guess how many Bitcoin somebody else has, right? Any more than uh, anyone else can. So it's kind of, uh, it kind of tears apart the privacy argument uh, that people can even ask the question without just going on a block explorer and finding out. Well, yeah, no, it's such a personal question. That's like asking how much do you have in your bank account, right? Because if, especially if you look at it yeah. as savings technology, it's like you wouldn't ask that. <laughs> For sure. So there's the bank account thing, but it's also the case that um, people enjoy showing their wealth, right? So that's why the NFT market is hot. That's yeah. why people own sports teams. That's why people own yachts. That's why they own mansions is to to show them and to use them. With Bitcoin, you don't really, there, there's not like a way of showing it and there's not a way of using it. And it is a pure monetary asset. And uh, people, you know, you could never guess you know, there's actually a book called The Millionaire Next Door. It's about how the person next door to you might have a million dollars of financial assets, you know, that you can't see. Right. And um, that that's really the narrow category of stores of wealth that you can hold without, uh, you know, having to buy a mansion or something like that. Um, and fiat actually incentivizes people to go out into either financial investing or into buying luxury goods. Because if the value of your fiat is going down, you're like, not only should I buy luxury goods, I should buy it on credit. Because even if I'm paying 20% interest, yeah. um, you know, the value of whatever I'm holding is increasing by more than 20%. No, that's so true. Wait, so how did you turn this into a business? I mean, how did you, how did you form your, your institute and start your advisory company? How did you take it from, you know, you're working in accounting to all of a sudden Bitcoin's your full-time job? Yeah, that was thanks to Twitter. Um, so... I started tweeting uh, things, my thoughts on Bitcoin uh, while I was still working in accounting. And uh, that's what really, you know, and I was also posting on Reddit as well. Um, and I guess for whatever reason, people thought I had some fairly reasonable things to say or uh, highly controversial things to say that nobody else was saying and uh, was able to develop a following such that you know, I was getting DMs left and right of people saying like, hey, can you help me with this? Help me with that. Uh, can you promote this project or learn about this and come on your podcast and talk about it and all this stuff? So um, that's really how it emerged was just by uh, posting my hot takes on Twitter and uh, building a following that way. So what does the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute do for people that don't know about it? Yeah, so that was founded by my good friend, Michael Goldstein, uh, and he was uh, happy enough to bring me on board the um, the board for that, on board the board. Uh, and he he really, what he wanted to do was collect all of the, what Satoshi wrote, but also all of the things that Satoshi uh, cites. And so to kind of build out a, um, a, 
an archive, a curated archive of writings that precede Bitcoin and then also writings about Bitcoin uh, and specifically writings that uh, kind of withstood the test of time. So there's lots of things that have been written about Bitcoin that are uh, that did not age well. Um, and so he wanted to focus on things that were really uh, timeless and not just like news articles. Why is it? Why do you think it's so hard to figure out the identity? Like, do you think we'll ever figure out who Satoshi is? Well, so that's a great question. Why is it so hard um, to figure out the identity? I mean, presumably, if the NSA is any good at their job, they know who it is because they've been uh, watching us, uh, you know, with warrantless wiretaps and whatnot for uh, the, the since the start of the war on terror. But in any case, uh, if they don't know, um, I don't see how anyone else could figure it out. And uh, apparently Satoshi was very good at covering their trail. Uh, I say there because we don't know if it was a, a guy, a group of people, you know, a woman. It could have been anyone using uh, whatever pseudonym. You know, they use a Japanese pseudonym. They might not be Japanese. Mm -hmm. By all indications, they're an English speaker. So, um, you know, it, it might have been an extraterrestrial or, <laughs> or an act of God. Uh, we don't know. Isn't it amazing how we're in sort of the perfect environment that presents a um, a value case for Bitcoin with the amount of inflation? I mean, obviously, we're not in a war, but we kind of are with the pandemic, how much money we've spent, how many trillions of dollars have been printed. Um, it almost seems like the perfect time for Bitcoin to have its super cycle. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I definitely agree that on the money printing side, uh, that is a tailwind. Um, but I, ultimately, I don't think it's the causal mechanism, because I think that even without COVID and even without the money printing response, that the market would basically be where it is today. Um, and uh, the reason I think that is that ultimately the fiat system has to live off of creating more money. That's all the entire inv incentive structure is built around that. And um you know, whether they do that through the debt system or by deficit spending as part of the government, like the MMT people are for. Um, if you look at the history of the U.S., for example, the amount of government spending just consistently increases. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is that eventually it hits a ceiling where the government is spending so much money that it's controlling so much of the economy that the free part of the economy that's creating value uh, is stifled and unable to grow and unable to, to deliver. Um, now, uh, thankfully, we've been having technological revolutions on the free part of the economy. So specifically in, you know, IT and information services um, and then uh, uh, oil and gas. So the development of those industries has helped, you know, uh, avoid the monetary problems of the inflation going on in the rest of the economy, um, because ultimately they're driving down costs uh, while the uh, money printers are uh, driving up costs. And so it nets out to like two percent. But if they were not if they were not inflating fiat uh, and we just looked at productivity growth and, uh, you know, the increase of wealth of Americans, um, you know, we would we would be way better off. Uh, they're destroying a huge amount of value with the money printing. And we don't even see it because we don't see the alternative universe. Yeah. Instead, we just see the net result. Um, in any case, that is going to constantly cause people to try to find better stores of value. So uh, whether it's uh, mortgage-backed securities, right? <laughs> right? So if you look at the history of the financial system, they were looking for a store of value. And they were like, well, mortgages would be a great store of value. And so they were buying up all these mortgages. And then the issuers of mortgages would go to uh, rating agencies and say, hey, we need more AAA mortgages yep. because yep. people want to use it as a store of value. How do we get more AAA mortgages? And the rating agencies, well, like they, they reacted with, here's how you could do it. You just have more subprime mortgages yeah. and magically you'll have more AAA uh, mortgage-backed securities. Um, obviously, it didn't work out. Uh, and... The other way to get uh, more stores of value is, for example, people will use real estate as a store of value where they don't live there. They don't even rent it out. They just buy an apartment in, on Manhattan or London 
and it just sits empty. Yep. And they just use it as store value. Um, but I think that the more uh, problematic one is the stock market. So people just expect stocks to only go up because every time they go down, the central banks intervene and bail out the stock market. And the problem with that is that ultimately the way that the central banks bail out the stock market is by lowering interest rates. Mm -hmm. Eventually you get to 0% interest rates and that's where we're at. Yeah. And some countries are going to negative interest rates. Yeah. And when you go into negative interest rates, the problem is that at that point, any asset like Bitcoin that has a 0% interest rate, so you don't earn any interest on just holding Bitcoin. You have to lend out Bitcoin to earn interest. Uh, in, in the fiat financial system, it's, uh, if you just hold cash at the central bank, they'll pay you an interest rate. And right now, central banks are actually you know, making you pay th them an interest rate. And so there's every incentive to get rid of your fiat and to buy any other asset. And that's, I think, part of why we're seeing this huge uh, surge in demand, especially in Europe, for Bitcoin, for other stores of value is because of this monetary policy. The fundamentals of the system are going to continue to attract demand, both from individuals, but now from corporations. Yeah. The corporations, you know, corporations hold money just like anyone else. Uh, and... Uh, if you look at their balance sheets, a lot of corporations hold a lot of money right? and they're not actually putting it to, a, um, you know, some kind of, they're not hiring people. They're not building factories. They're just holding cash on their balance sheet. Yeah. Well, why do you think there aren't more Michael Saylors and why do you think corporations like the Apples or even like the Oracles, they haven't bought into it yet? Uh, it's really because they are still in the mindset of those three initial objections to Bitcoin. It won't scale. Uh, it's bad for the environment and it's too volatile. And so uh, if, you know, those to me are kind of the three gatekeepers that stop someone from adopting Bitcoin and they have to be able to navigate those gatekeepers because there's a whole um, it's like a labyrinth, basically, of different ideas and different arguments for all three. Um, and until you go down that rabbit hole, as we call it, uh, and, and come to understand Bitcoin, first of all, so on the volatility that while it is volatile, what's going on is that you have the price that's oscillating around the fundamental value. And that's just what markets do. So the, the fundamental value is increasing. The price is just oscillating around that as, and that's driving the volatility. Um, and you know you have to understand markets uh, to for this to make sense because there's just a lot of momentum traders and there's a lot of leverage traders who are the ones that are causing these market uh, volatility uh, episodes. And so someone like Michael Saylor who understands markets and is also thinking long term, like this isn't about am I buying Bitcoin at the right price based on where we are in the cycle, right. which is what the traders think about. Michael Saylor is like, well, I'm going to be holding this for like 50 years. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what part of the current cycle I'm in, as long as I'm part of the macro cycle, which is all of this, uh, all of this store of values that have been used as uh, monetary assets, basically used for savings, whether it's bonds, real estate, uh, equities, all of that monetary premium, the store of value premium is going to go to Bitcoin that that's going to cause its value to to increase because now people don't need to use these more illiquid assets uh, in order to hold value across time. Well, I would argue that the volatility aspect is what's keeping the majority of just average people out of it. It's just it seems scary. It seems really expensive now. What do you want people to know about it that are like, should I get in or should I not? It seems like a huge yeah. risk. Yeah, so absolutely. So um, I think that, first of all, the, 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 the part about timing the market is actually related to the volatility. That is that Bitcoin is so volatile, it's very hard to time the market and to decide, OK, is it going to dip or is it going to go up? We don't know. And nobody really knows uh, in the short term. And it's in the medium term, you know, there are these four year cycles. Uh, and then in the long term, you know, I, there's differing views. Like, I think it's going to keep going up. There are people who think it's going to go to zero. So really, 
it's on on the individual to go do fundamental research to see what are the arguments for Bitcoin going to zero, and what are the arguments for Bitcoin continuing to attract adoption. Um, now, on, on the question of like the the volatility keeping people out, it also brings in a lot of people. So mm -hmm. some people are really interested in finding volatile investments because they think that they're going to be able to trade it. And um, Bitcoin has attracted a huge amount of traders. Uh, and so it's it really is, um, you know, for, for the long term saver, it works great. And for the short term trader, it also works great. The challenge is the person in between who is like medium term. Uh, and, you know, for them, it's really about what percentage of your portfolio are you going to put in your Bitcoin? So you don't have to put 100 percent in. You can put in one or five percent and kind of just say, all right, well, it's too volatile for a big position. So I'm just going to scale down that position to the risk tolerance that I have uh, with with prices. Well, I really think that one of the reasons that the price has gone to the highs that it has is because of the the community around it, the memers, which I feel like you're a part of it. So how does that, how do you think that impacts the, not only the price, but also just people's awareness of it and intention to maybe learn more about it? Yeah. So with the memes, uh, there's a survival bias. So there has been, there have been lots of bad memes uh, throughout the history of, of Bitcoin and of crypto. Um, people trying to artificially create memes in the lab uh, and, uh, you know, not getting a lot of traction. Um, and really, the memes that have stuck around that have survived are both authentic and also um, they are in in harmony with Bitcoin's nature. Um, because ultimately, the, the memes that contradict Bitcoin, uh, they don't last very long. Uh, they get killed off because there's no one there to repeat them. Um, so the biggest one is HODL, right? So H-O-D-L. Um, the mainstream media thinks that it stands for hold on for dear life, which is incorrect. <laughs> if anyone from the mainstream media is listening, that's incorrect. It's from a drunken forum post in Bitcoin Talk where the author misspelled the word uh, hold. <laughs> and uh, his point was basically that, uh, indeed, these assets are so volatile and his judgment is so poor. And, you know, clearly he's intoxicated that uh, he's just going to hold because there's not really he doesn't want to trade. Uh, and so that emerged as a dominant meme because it speaks to the truth of the asset, which is that there's lots of traders who have gotten wrecked by trying to time the market. Um, and there's lots of holders who have held who have seen the value of their asset increase just by the passage of time without any effort or work on their part. Uh, and obviously, you know, just uh, a steady hand and not wanting to, to take on more risk. But so you're all in, like you just have maybe a few months worth of living for in US dollars, and you, but you're all in on Bitcoin. Uh, no, I'm very diversified. Uh, I think that intellectually I'm all in uh, for it. sure. But um, financially, uh, you know, you've got to work with a financial planner to have uh, something that makes sense for, for your life uh, because there's not really uh, any single uh, template, right? So my wife is a financial planner, thankfully. So uh, I don't really have to worry too much about that side of things. Um, but really, I think that what it comes down to is what, what am I excited about from the point of view of what's going to combine libertarian ideology, Austrian economics, uh, you know, fundamentals um, and uh, the the engineering sense of it, too, that uh, this can't get hacked like there's uh, there's cryptographic verification of everything. Um, and so that part of it, I find fascinating as well. Um, and the decentralization of it. Um, but uh, ultimately, like that's when, when, you know, I get into arguments with uh, altcoin people all the time. I know. <laughs> even, with, even with fiat people all the time, where, for example, a fiat person would be like, um, you know, uh, Bitcoin's a horrible asset and it's going to go to zero. And I'm like, all right, well, either we can argue about why you think that, or we can engage in the meta game of, hey, why don't you put skin in the game and why don't you short Bitcoin if you think it's going to zero? Yeah, that's true. And, and put a bet on it. And 
I I don't like that uh, the second one. I really don't. My background is Lincoln and Douglas debate. Let's take out some values. Let's argue about some definitions, and then let's come up with the best arguments for either side. You know, I want to litigate it. I don't want to just uh, financially put a bet on it uh, because um, you know that's that's the French side is the uh, the interest in arguing uh, over something. Okay, last couple of questions. Um, what do you think of the stock to flow chart by Plan B? Uh, so again, hotly debated. Uh, I think that both sides have great arguments. Ultimately, I come down on the side right in the middle, uh, which is that um, for people who are trying to predict what Bitcoin's price is going to be in the future with some kind of uh, boundary conditions, right? Of like, all right, I don't know what exactly the price is going to be, obviously, at, on December 31st. But I think it's going to be between 10 grand and 100 grand. Okay, so some people's reaction to that is like, well, that's too wide of a range. <laughs> and other people are like, no, it's going to zero. And other people are like, no, it's going to a million dollars. And so everyone's got an opinion and uh, no one really knows. But in terms of narrowing it down to what I think is a reasonable range, the stock to flow model makes a lot of sense, um, especially like if we zoom out longer term. Um, day to day or month to month, nobody has a model that is actually going to predict the price. Uh, there's just, uh, and, and then there's a the question of like, what is the value of predicting the price? Mm -hmm. right? Because if you buy into the arguments for Bitcoin that, okay, you can hold your own keys, you can run your own node, you can, uh, there's 21 million Bitcoin. Okay, let's say those are the three arguments for Bitcoin. If you believe in those, then you don't really need to worry about what Bitcoin's day-to-day -day price is going to do because you're just looking at those three fundamentals. You're seeing those improving day-to-day -day, uh, and not getting worse. Uh, and so uh, there's not really any purpose to uh, being concerned about uh, which model is going to work well. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, I know scalability kind of gets into some of the more advanced aspects of Bitcoin and the Lightning Network and all that. But do you have kind of more a, a more general um, answer to why you believe that Bitcoin is scalable when you get to a level of if it's really highly adopted, how all these transactions are going to be verified and, and what will the incentive be to mine after all the coins are already mined? Yeah, so fundamentally, the problem with Bitcoin is that it's a global broadcast system. So uh, everyone everyone shares all the same data. Uh, and so if you want to run a Bitcoin node, you have to download like 400 gigabytes of ledger data to verify it all. Uh, and what that allows you to do is twofold. One, you can verify that transactions being sent to you are actually going to you. Um, because if you have to use a third party data provider, uh, they could actually be lying to you. So you have to trust them. There's a trusted third party. And uh, what Bitcoin allows you to do is not have a trusted third party where you can verify yourself using an open network on the internet and cryptography to verify all 350 gigabytes of this data. Yeah. Now, the other thing that it lets you do is you can verify Bitcoin's monetary policy independently. So traditionally you have to like trust the Federal Reserve uh, that whatever they're saying about how much money printing they're doing is the truth. Um, with Bitcoin, you can actually verify it yourself. And if any of the miners try to create more Bitcoin, you can reject their block and prevent them from uh, causing artificial inflation. Um, so those are two huge advantages. And the, the cost of that is having to download all this data. And so that's why Bitcoin's not scalable on that layer. Now, there's secondary layers being built. One of them is Lightning, the other is Liquid. And the concept there is that instead of doing a global broadcast, let's have a peer-to-peer -peer broadcast. And we'll only use Bitcoin's blockchain um, as the settlement layer if there's ever a dispute between two peers. So basically, in, in law, for example, you don't go to a court every time you rely on a contract. Right. You only go to court when you disagree with each other and you're suing each other. So sure. that's yeah. the same concept of these secondary layers is, hey, just have off-chain negotiations of value transfer that can be instant and you know zero fee. And then if you ever disagree, drop back down to the Bitcoin blockchain and settle your dispute. Um, and so it's a very, uh, very smart engineering system that helps it stay decentralized while also 
bigger picture scaling the system. What country do you think will be the first to adopt the Bitcoin standard? Well, uh, the internet. Um, I think that the internet is emerging as kind of a super sovereign entity. So uh, it's not really part of any one um, country at this point. Um, most websites are even hosted in multiple different countries. And so, uh, you know, they, they're in different data centers. And um, if we look at large internet companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, these are uh, trillion dollar companies, Microsoft too, uh, they're, you know, arguably more powerful than some governments. And we've seen them uh, behave in such a way uh, where they actually behave as governments or they uh, lobby the government to change the rules or they, they uh, have employees that go work for the government and take it over. And so this actually, this happened under the Obama administration. So many people came from Google to the Obama administration that they essentially controlled the executive branch of the government and were able to do a lot of favorable things for Google. Uh, and they obviously, they, they lobby at the legislative level as well. Um, and they're actually starting to create their own governments as well. Uh, we're seeing Nevada uh, is creating a, uh, a tech controlled government. Uh, it's controlled by tech corporations. It's like uh, a fascinating experiment. So. Um, I would say that the internet itself is, is sovereign, and then a lot of internet companies are sovereign. And what Bitcoin allows is for individuals to become sovereigns. Because now if you run a Bitcoin node, you are part of like a sovereign part of this uh, sovereign Bitcoin network. And uh, that to me is, is really what a reserve asset is. Ultimately, a reserve asset is an asset that's held by a sovereign. And uh, that's why I, I really think that Bitcoin as a reserve asset starts with individuals and has started with individuals and then is moving to corporations with MicroStrategy and others, uh, Square, um, and is going to move to uh, governments eventually where governments will be acquiring Bitcoin. The US government currently holds 70,000 Bitcoin, which is worth about $3 billion. Uh, and I'm lobbying them to not sell those Bitcoin. Uh, so I have drafted the U.S. HODL Act, and uh, it would direct the U.S. Marshal Service to not auction off the Bitcoin they've seized so that we can start having a, a national reserve of Bitcoin. That's so fascinating. Wait, so um, where do you see the relationship of the U.S. dollar with Bitcoin? So the U.S. dollar is going to get replaced by Bitcoin. And so uh, eventually the U.S. dollar won't exist anymore. Um, now, they will create um, a U.S. dollar cryptocurrency. And there are some that already exist. So Tethers, for example, is very controversial, but it's a uh, stable coin um, and USDC. Uh, and there's there's a variety of others. There's also decentralized ones that have emerged, uh, like DAI on Ethereum is a stable coin. And uh, there's actually new technology on Bitcoin that allows you to create stable coins on Bitcoin. So... Um, the premise of a central bank creating a stable coin is the central premise of any central bank, which is that they want to print money, money, and they're going to print money in whatever format that takes. Right. So uh, if they can print money using uh, a cryptographic network, um, they will do that. Uh, if they print money using the banking system, they do that. If they can print money, you know, um, directly with the government, uh, they do that in a lot of countries. Now, Will that compete with Bitcoin? I don't think so. So they would be competing with other private payment systems um, like ACH or wire transfers yeah. or, um, and I say private by, in the sense that they are um, closed networks. Uh, and so to join the ACH network, you have to apply. Now, if central banks create networks that are closed as well, then they, they're just reinventing the wheel. So they have to create new networks that are open, in which case they're really going to uh, take market share away from closed networks. But they won't take away market share from Bitcoin because Bitcoin's not about that. It's about having purchasing power increase. And that's where the number go up meme has come from, you know, and the hodl meme. As far as the stock market, I'm just kind of curious because in a lot of ways, especially this last year, uh, Bitcoin is correlated with the stock market and it crashed back last March and then now it's back up. At some point, the money printer has to stop. At some point, the inflation policies 
have to end. A lot of strategists are expecting another major crash. I mean, some I've read online are predicting like 60 to 85%. If something like that happens, what do you think will happen to Bitcoin? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think that uh, Bitcoin has always been correlated with the stock market in general. And it's only in particular windows of time where you see a decorrelation. And um, why that's the case, uh, again, is hotly debated because it's related to the stock to flow ratio, um, that debate. But um, it is, for example, with COVID, when COVID had that um, crash in March, uh, Bitcoin crashed as well. So uh, in the short term, Bitcoin is always uh, correlated with the uh, equities markets. Uh, that's because uh, the traders that are attracted to Bitcoin's volatility are also trading stocks. And so when they have a liquidity crisis, they have to liquidate assets across their portfolios, including Bitcoin. Um, HODLers, you know, Bitcoin enthusiasts, quite a few of them are not trading, first of all, and they're not trading stocks. And so they're not really phased by the stock market crashing. Yeah. And they're kind of the other side of the trade where they're like, oh, wow, Bitcoin's on sale. Uh, and here's a deal to, to be made. And um, those are the uh, hodlers of last resort. Yeah, gosh, I wish I had bought way more last March. Oh my gosh, when it went back down to what, like 3,000? I'm like kicking myself. Um, Every has regret stories. That's one of the constants in this space is that <laughs> there's people who are like, oh, why did I do that? Like for me, it's like, why did I pay off my student loan debts instead of buying more Bitcoin? It's like, <laughs> Okay, well, you can second guess yourself, you know, all day long. But um, I think, though, that if you have a recurring buy open, then you don't have to worry about trying to time the market at all. And it's going to automatically buy when the market's down and automatically buy when the market's going up as well. Yeah, the dollar cost average. Yeah, that's that's the great way to go, I think. Um, oh, I just wanted to ask you, Michael Saylor, do you think at any point he will liquidate? Yeah, so there's people who say that the whales you know, have to prove themselves, right? They have to be seen in combat. It's it's great to be a fair weather friend of Bitcoin, right? Where, oh, yeah. it's going up. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm in on this momentum trade. Um, but to hold through an 80% drawdown, you kind of got to be a true believer. And so there is the point of view that that is what separates uh, the true believers from the speculators. I, I think that, um, you know, it goes back to what I was saying about, uh, taking people's intellectual arguments seriously. And I do take Michael Saylor's intellectual arguments seriously. And so I think he gets it. And I so I don't think that, I think that he will be dollar cost averaging in uh, until uh, the dollar is no more. I can't believe he owns more than Coinbase. I think that's amazing. Um, who's your favorite Bitcoin memer? Favorite Bitcoin memer. Um, so obviously uh, one of the most, recent memes that has been highly controversial, it's been highly controversial, is have fun staying poor. Uh, and uh, essentially telling people that uh, it, it's fine for them to have arguments against Bitcoin, but that just means that they're excluding themselves from the financial upside to Bitcoin. And that there's not really any reason to persuade them because uh, the market will prove them wrong. I, I think that's a little, uh, it's first of all, it's crass, but it's also uh, intellectually uh, empty, but it has emerged as a great meme. And uh, the author, you know, Udi, he didn't get that uh, from himself. He got it from the DeFi people. The DeFi people were saying, hey, here's this hot new trend in cryptocurrencies and the Bitcoin people are going to be left holding the Bitcoin bag. And they were telling us have fun staying poor because they were earning yields on farming. Uh, and it's kind of like the the NFT, uh, you know, wave of popularity happening right now. And it gets to a deeper point in this space. People get bored of Bitcoin. So they learn about Bitcoin, they're excited about it, and then they get bored by it. Mm -hmm. And uh, either they just kind of move on to a different hobby. And this happened to me uh, during the first cycle after I heard about Bitcoin. Really? I got into quadcopters. I was like, all right, I want to build my own quadcopter. I, I love this concept of you know flying a helicopter or whatever. Um, and completely unrelated to, to Bitcoin. But the reason is that Bitcoin's boring. Like, you know, you buy some and then what else is there to do? And people <laughs> criticize it for that. They're like, okay, I bought some Bitcoin. What do I do with it now? Uh, they're expecting some kind of 
uh, entertainment from holding Bitcoin. But that's the point of Bitcoin is that it is boring, that it's a, a long term asset that you can hold without worrying about it, without thinking about it every day. Now, obviously, people on Twitter are thinking about it every day. Um, but the other thing is that people get bored by it and they, they look for something more exciting. So if you look at uh, the other cryptocurrencies, they're like, well, it has this feature. It has this new feature. And that's exciting. And so I'm going to go uh, invest time and energy into figuring this out and making money off of it. Bitcoin people are like, well, what, what are the trade-offs? Well, it's more complicated. Okay, well, immediately we're not interested in that trade-off because we're trying to keep it simple. Because if we add, start adding complexity to this, yeah. then yeah. Who, who knows what's going to happen to this monetary system? It could fail. It's working today. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that is kind of what drives people to think, well, Bitcoin's boring and we're going to go find other protocols. Now, there are improvements to Bitcoin that make it simpler uh, and less complicated. And the Bitcoin developers are happy to adopt those. Uh, and so we're, we're seeing, uh, for example, Taproot is a new scripting system that is better and uh, has better trade-offs for developers than the existing scripting system. So there's definitely opportunities for improvement. But when the improvement is at the cost of something, right, at the cost of scalability, at the cost of complexity, then the developers don't want to add it. And the users who do want to add it, they can just go start their own cryptocurrency. That's the beauty of being open source is that they can fork it. They can even write their own code from scratch uh, and they can build systems with different trade offs, even if they fail to change Bitcoin. It's, it's interesting, the meme that you brought up, the have fun staying poor, because let's say, you know, the premise becomes a reality and Bitcoin becomes adopted as, as the, a major currency. That's also a really scary world because people, I mean, if you think about the Weimar Republic and people losing their value, do you see that possibly happening in our life where there's a lot of people that, you know, they hold a lot of their savings in a 401k, they're waiting to retire, they don't know what Bitcoin is, they don't use a lot of technology or there's, you know, there's a lot of people that are just unaware of how this all works and what crypto is. That's a scary place for those people. Yeah, so absolutely it is. So um, it really gets down to where are where's the value going to accrue, right? Who's not going to be poor? Uh, and it's people who hold Bitcoin, frankly. Um, now, how do you hold Bitcoin? You could hold your own keys. You could hold a, an ETF like GBTC, but you could also hold shares of a company that holds Bitcoin. So if you own shares of MicroStrategy, you own Bitcoin. If you hold shares of um, a Bitcoin, a publicly traded Bitcoin mining company like Riot Blockchain, you hold Bitcoin. Um, soon, if you hold shares of Facebook, you'll, or sorry, not of Facebook, uh, of uh, Coinbase, uh, you'll, you'll be holding Bitcoin. And same thing with Tesla. And so there's a growing number of publicly traded companies that are holding Bitcoin. And so everyone who holds those shares, now, quite often they hold those shares through uh, a uh, index fund, for example, in a 401k. And so even if you hold a 401k today, you already hold Bitcoin. And so everyone who is exposed to Bitcoin in any way is going to benefit from this. Now, um, I think that as more and more corporates add Bitcoin to their balance sheets, it's going to cause more and more upside to accrue to uh, traditional investors um, from Bitcoin's monetization. So I think that's overall very positive. And the other thing that we're seeing is insurance companies are buying Bitcoin. So who will benefit from that? Well, it's people who have insurance claims uh, and investors in insurance companies as well, which are a major part of the economy. So I do think that Bitcoins are getting very widely distributed in this cycle through institutional ownership um, and also on individual ownership. Signups at platforms like Kraken, at Square, uh, Cash App, um, but also PayPal is adding Bitcoin. Um, you know, there's there's uh, Robinhood has added Bitcoin. We're even seeing mainstream financial institutions like Charles Schwab talk about like, hey, we're going to add Bitcoin eventually as well. Yeah. Um, obviously, Fidelity and uh, TD Ameritrade are also getting into it. So you know, there's. Um, an increasing number of ways that this huge wave of new retail adopters are buying Bitcoin. And so it's getting more and more distributed where like the people who uh, don't benefit from Bitcoin's rise 
are going to be like few and far in between uh, because ultimately this is you know increasingly democratized. Um, really, the people who won't benefit are the people who are currently benefiting from fiat inflation. So if the U.S. dollar gets replaced by Bitcoin, it's whoever is benefiting from U.S. dollars, whoever is receiving U.S. dollars that will um, be in a tough spot. And uh, generally, that's bondholders who have dollar denominated uh, fixed income instruments. They're actually getting exposure to Bitcoin as well, though, uh, through uh, convertible bonds issued by Michael Saylor. And so the fixed income market is able to buy Bitcoin as well. So ultimately, the, the Fed is going to own Bitcoin as well. So really, even the people who are currently benefiting from the dollar system, they're also interested in acquiring Bitcoin. And um, it'll be, I think, a fairly painless swap. Um, now, there's going to be uh, the upside of it from a fundamental economics perspective, right, which is that uh, a huge amount of dollar creation was going to bad economic activity, whether it's um, those empty apartments that we talked about, right? Okay, of driving up rents, driving up real estate prices, causing problems for families that are trying to, you know, establish themselves. And so it's increasingly hard for people to enter the real estate market. Uh, those people are going to benefit. Um, and the people who were storing wealth in, in houses, they're going to store wealth in Bitcoin instead. And so it's not like they're they're going to lose a store of value. They're just shifting their store of value from houses to Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, across the different markets, wherever there's distortions like that, we're going to see it benefit one group of people, which is the people who are actually trying to use the asset. Uh, and then and that's the same thing with stocks, right? There's people who are actually interested in investing in stocks. And then there's people who are just interested in having a savings account where they're they've they don't want to get diluted to do inflation. Um, and it's going to allow us to separate those two markets and ultimately to have a much more robust stock market and uh, savers are ab actually able to ca hold cash. Any um, just takeaways? What do you want people to know for for especially those that are just kind of new to this space? What do you want people to know? Yeah, um, first of all, that you can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. Uh, you don't have to go to the extremes of like, I've got to have a hardware wallet and a full node before I buy Bitcoin. Like you can or like I've got to read the Bitcoin standard before I buy Bitcoin. You can buy like $20 worth of Bitcoin on most of the retail platforms today. And, uh, you know, you don't have to go all in on it on day zero. Um, and the reason I say that is because ultimately you've got to use these new technologies in order to come to appreciate them. And one of the key ways of using Bitcoin is to just hold some. Uh, that, that's like uh, what usually gives people their first good impression is that they see the value of uh, the Bitcoin that they're holding increase in purchasing power. Um, so there's that. And then when, you're, when you are actually interested in holding your own keys, you don't have to move all of your Bitcoin to your own keys. You can move a small amount and test it out and try out different ways of holding your Bitcoin. There's different platforms as well. There's like Casa and Unchained Capital that help you with managing your own keys. Um, and then the third thing is that for developers, there's a whole new universe of financial applications being built on top of Bitcoin. Whether it's boring ones like merchant payment processing, uh, like VTC Pay Server uh, and the Lightning Network, um, or more exciting ones of creating derivatives, options, and futures using discrete log contracts uh, that uh, use uh, price oracles. You know, there's like a huge uh, swath of different things that are waiting to to be built and that have already been built uh, that developers can get interested in. Um, so those are kind of the three major ones. You don't have to become a developer though to hold Bitcoin or to run your own node or to hold your own keys. Um, but that's ultimately what I like about Bitcoin is that it has many different options. And also, uh, you can take any level of responsibility you want to have commensurate with the amount of freedom that that gives you. Are you one of the people that believe that one Bitcoin will be enough to to live on for the rest of your life? I've seen that tweeted out or one Bitcoin means you're a billionaire or something. Oh, well, so what is true is that if you hold 10 Bitcoin, that you're a billionaire because uh, 10 Bitcoin has one billion Satoshis in it uh, because uh, each Bitcoin has 100 million Satoshis. So if you own one Bitcoin, you're a hundred millionaire um, and uh, so on and so forth. 
if we use Satoshis as our unit of account for designating who's a billionaire. If we use dollars, um, there's not really any way of knowing what Bitcoin's terminal value will be in terms of today's dollar purchasing power. Uh, I've heard a lot of different plausible hypotheses um, because basically what you can do is you can take the, the total money supply of uh, fiat, yeah. total gold supply. And if you say, all right, well, Bitcoin's going to take over those two markets, then it's going to be like today, Bitcoin's at 50 grand. If it gets 100% market share, it'll be at $10 million per Bitcoin. Yeah, like that's the sailor argument. Right. And and then there's others who are like, okay, that's way too bullish. Like there's no way it takes the whole market. And then there's others who say that's way too bearish because ultimately not only is Bitcoin taking over gold and uh, money, it's also taking over every other store of value. So it's taking over real estate, equities, mm -hmm. bonds, and uh, insurance uh, and you know financial derivatives. So then you're talking about way bigger numbers that um, you know people always find incredible, you know, it, it just uh, not 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 credible. Um, so it's to me, it's like okay, we can get into the speculative argument of what the terminal value will be, um, but for today, really, the question is much simpler: is do you think that adoption is going to to continue to increase, or do you think we've reached max adoption today? Um, so. If people think that like this is the ceiling of adoption, I don't think they're paying attention to the data or to the conversations happening. Totally. Like, because we see a funnel of adoption and we see the top of that funnel and it's growing. So I don't really see any reason why that would reverse anytime soon uh, to where it would really be going down long term. Um, and that's really all you need to know in order to, to wonder whether uh, you should be getting interested in it today or not. What's your price prediction for December 31st, 2021? Uh, so I, I think that we'll be um, bouncing above 100K. So uh, that and I think that's relatively conservative. OK, last question. When you think back on your life and your career, I mean, when you think about that kid that was sitting on Wikipedia, you know, just studying economics and the difference between the accounts of World War II in the U.S. versus France, like what? Is there anything you would just tell your younger self? Like, what do you wish you knew back then? I thought I was wasting time, right? I was just kind of like in this like uh, self-directed learning that uh, was ultimately a waste of time because it uh, wouldn't have any benefit to me long term. And that was the mindset I was in. And, um, you know, if I could go back and, and tell that that young person that, no, actually, there's a viable career here, I'd be like, get out of here. Like, the, you know, I'll be working as an accountant, uh, you know, making money during the day and then moonlighting as someone interested in these other topics. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Coin Stories. I'd love to connect with you if you have questions or guest requests, so feel free to get in touch on Twitter at Nat Brunel or Instagram at Natalie Brunel. Take care till next time.